so while we are waiting for our videographer, we're just going to go into this with uh, introductions. <coughs> uh, I'll start with myself. My name is uh, Nellie Bailey. I co-host uh, Black Agenda Radio with Glenn Ford, who is the executive. Uh, uh, he's the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. He is also the producer and co and host of Black Agenda Radio, and again, I co-host that with him. Um, I have been a long-time housing uh, rights advocacy advocate uh, in Harlem. Uh, we have uh, had an anti-gentrification campaign for about two decades, and as we all know and recognize, that uh, we have been on the losing end of that in large part to our black misleadership class in cities all over the country. And, um, and this uh, panel is called Understanding Our Resistance. And uh, we all have to get with our little technology here. And uh, this is a, a very important, and it's, it's unusual for the left because instead of an array of speakers, we only have two. And so we can go in depth with an analysis of the crisis of imperialism and the implosion of the deep state. And we see it every day. Um, so this panel, Understanding Our Resistance, has the following uh, synopsis. Contradictions of U.S. Empire. Trump and the neocons. The central question of U.S. politics is centered upon whether or not the U.S. Empire can achieve hegemony in the face of China, Russia, and new emerging global alliances. And uh, our key speakers, again, are Dr. Anthony Montero, who will challenge, along with Glenn Ford, uh, both will challenge the conventional wisdom of the U.S. left. Professor Anthony Montero is a Du Boisian scholar. He is also a regular contributor to Black Agenda, for, uh, to Black Agenda Report. And again, Glenn Ford is the executive editor of uh, Black Agenda Report. And um, I believe, uh, and our videographer is Don DeBar, who will give me the signal. In about one second. In <laughs> one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, while we're waiting for that, I do encourage you to, to uh, perhaps um, uh, attend our uh, another Black Agenda um, uh, workshop that we have, Resisting Trump, Exposing the Democrats. And that's today uh, from 3.30 p.m. to 5.15 p.m. And that's in room 1.91. So you might uh, want to attend that. Okay, are we ready? Go ahead, and um, this is the first, we, we're recording over here, so it's okay. Oh, okay, so shall I? Just put that in the middle, of, like right on the point there. And yeah, right, I don't have to go through that introduction nope. again, do we, I? No, we got enough tape here. Okay, great. So we're going to uh, start uh, right now, and I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Glenn Ford and uh, Tony Montero. <laughs> you really have uh, one and a half speakers here. I'm going to uh, uh, follow uh, Tony Montero's lead as uh, is often the case when we uh, speak frequently on Black Agenda <laughs> Radio uh, uh, because he leads us in, in directions that I think we want this conversation uh, to go. And so I'm passing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, thank you very much, Glenn and Nelly. <laughs> I'd like to thank Nelly for setting this up. And, um, you know, uh, usually, uh, well, many times when I'm on uh, Black Agenda Radio being interviewed by Glenn after the interview is over, 
I ask him, why do you always ask me the most difficult questions? <laughs> Everybody else gets, it seems to me, easier questions. <laughs> um, See, we question on a curve. Right? <laughs> oh, okay, no, I'm glad to know that. But um, I've always enjoyed my interactions with Glenn because I'm certain as most of you or all of you in here know, uh, Glenn is not just a journalist, but he is a major intellectual on the left. And um, if we have a new name for our black sellouts, the black misleadership class, we owe that insight to Glenn Ford. And um, I am unable, uh, I don't have the opportunity always to thank him for so much of what he does. Now, Nellie uh, pulled this together, and we talked about it, and one of the things that we are concerned about is some of the problems in the left and what is called, and I put quotes, the resistance. Uh, I think this conference, this forum, is called the resistance. Uh, and clearly, and I'm certain many of you would uh, kind of agree with this, how do we distinguish the left from the liberals and neoliberals? How is the left not the same as the corporate Democrats? Uh, and uh, really, the deep state. We see this convergence, and the left and I would say pretty much the white left, has not been able to come forward with a consistent analysis appropriate to this moment in the history of, of world capitalism. Uh, I would say just uh, to begin, that Trump's election was not an event. It was the result of processes, and I think we can uh, see it more clearly now, processes that perhaps go back to the Great Recession of 2007-2009. Uh, uh, the greatest uh, downturn in the economies of global capitalism since the Great Depression. And in a lot of ways, the political crisis, uh, which, you know, in interviews with Glenn, I usually refer to a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, that is to say, the old forms of governing and ruling the people are no longer acceptable to perhaps the majority of the people. Now that is not to say that uh, everyone has come to that conclusion from the same place politically. But I think it is beyond uh, question that we are in a crisis of legitimacy. All of the major institutions of governing and ruling the people are being rejected by the people. And so when you combine the uh, crisis of neoliberal capitalism with the crisis of uh, legitimacy, that is the people accepting the rule and governance of the governing class, uh, it begins to make more sense than the narrative, which is clearly the narrative of the corporate media, that on November 8th, we got the worst president in the history of the United States, who, along with all of his uh, 
reactionary views, and I want to say parenthetically, all of his views are not reactionary. Uh, along with that, he is uh, an idiot. You're giving idiots a bad name. Yes, yeah, maybe I'm giving idiots a bad name. But, but this narrative, which has pretty much been embraced by most of the left, is without any kind, I think, of understanding of a world beyond the politics of the United States and pretty much beyond bourgeois politics, electoral politics, Democrat and Republican politics. Now, and this comes from very sophisticated people. Need I mention Noam Chomsky? Need I mention Democracy Now? Need I mention most of uh, the most recognizable uh, left and progressive thinkers. So I begin there, a crisis. A crisis that did not begin on November 8th. Uh, a crisis that had been brewing for some time. More than that, uh, this is more than just an American phenomenon. Well, Brexit preceded our elections, but what about uh, the rejection of constitutional change in Italy. What about the vote called for by Syriza in Syria in uh, 2015, where the people voted to leave the EU? What about the political instability all across continental Europe? Uh, so this is not just an American affair. It is a crisis of legitimacy in the major centers of global capitalism. Now, unless, I'll stop, I'll, I'll end in a minute. But, unless we have an interest in saving capitalism, this should be, if not a moment for rejoicing, a moment for making strategic decisions about how we move forward. Not the left alone, but the left along with the broad masses of people. For example, and I'll, I, I just Pennsylvania. You know, Trump couldn't have won the Electoral College without Pennsylvania. I'm from Philadelphia. Philadelphia decided the way that Pennsylvania went, pretty much. The Clinton people had hoped for something equivalent to what happened in 2012 with Obama, that they would come out of Philadelphia uh, with uh, a 480 some thousand vote majority over the Republicans. And that, uh, that uh, 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 would carry them throughout the, the rest of the state of Pennsylvania. Well, something happened on the way to their victory. Black folk stayed at home. <clears throat> the black vote would have decided it. That is why Obama and Springsteen and Jay-Z and every other celebrity they could uh, draw upon came to Philadelphia. The appeal was not on the basis of we will improve the conditions of life of black Philadelphia. Philadelphia is, of the top 10 cities, the poorest in the nation. Proportionately, we are the most imprisoned city in the United States. They did not make an appeal that we would better your lives. The appeal was on identity. And if you did not vote for Clinton, Obama would see this as letting him down. Well, we let him down. <laughs> and it was that 45,000 fewer black votes in the city of Philadelphia that accounted for the majority of the 70-some thousand plurality that Trump had over Clinton in the state of Pennsylvania. This had not happened 
in almost three decades where the state of Pennsylvania did not go to the Democrats. And it reflected, some people say voter suppression, no. The votes were not suppressed in Philadelphia. In fact, there was a strong get out the vote in the black community movement that did not reach the level that it, that it, that it was expected to. And, and you know, again, you know, it was a moment for celebration, of celebration for us, because this was a serious blow to our black misleadership class in Philadelphia. And, you know, uh, not to make a big thing out of it, uh, we're trying to build on that. <laughs> uh, but uh, the crisis, the political crisis that is general is most acute among the African American people. The crisis of legitimacy of all of the major institutions, though kind of covered over in a certain way by the Obama presidency and that kind of representation and identity politics, when you get below the surface, it is deep and deepening among black Philadelphia. And if I could just say just two uh, quick things, just the political situation in Philadelphia, which was decisive, I think, in deciding Pennsylvania and probably the presidency. In 2015, there was a mayoral race. You know, in our city, whoever wins the Democratic primary, you know, kind of wins the election. There was a black candidate, a representative classic, traditional representative of the black misleadership class, the black political class. And on the other side, there was a white racial moderate, not radical, racial moderate, who was a city councilman, who because of his position on the city workers and wages and benefits, and because the largest unions in the city of Philadelphia are all black led, the black Labor leadership went with the white race moderate over the black uh, misleadership class candidate. Okay? Which meant a rejection of that leadership. But if that were not enough, we know we just had a district attorney's race. In that race, there was a white progressive, a supporter generally of Mumia Abu Jamal, against stop and frisk, a defense attorney, never a prosecutor, never a, um, a politician, and never run for office. There were seven candidates, one of whom was black. The black community voted overwhelmingly for the white progressive over the candidate of the black misleadership class. So here we have evidence of a growing independence of thought and a willingness to vote not on the basis of representation or, quote, race in its most superficial uh, construal, but on the issues and a rejection of the uh, uh, leadership. And I think this is, I, I, you know, I, I, I hope I'm not exaggerating. I think this is a pattern that is deepening, a rejection of the black misleadership class and a search for a new type of leadership, and I would argue a leadership that moves the black community towards substantive and radical issues of transformation. All right. <laughs> when we talk about the crisis of legitimacy, uh, usually folks talk, deal with that in terms of polls and uh, whether uh, the people uh, believe that the powers that be and their institutions are legitimate. But there's another way uh, to look at, at it, this phenomenon 
uh, as well. And that is the behavior of the ruling class in terms of uh, its own institutions. I mean, we have to see uh, the uh, electoral system and, in fact, the entire United States uh, set up since its uh, beginning uh, as a structure created by uh, the rulers uh, to facilitate their rule. And when they uh, abandon uh, these, these structures, when they uh, 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 politically undermine those structures, then we're looking at a real crisis. We're looking at the ruling class in crisis, and that is different uh, than a rejection uh, of uh, the uh, authorities by the underclasses. This is something even more uh, profound, and, and we're w witnessing uh, this uh, uh, today. Uh, the, the, the rulers are undermining the, the right now, uh, the office of the presidency. Uh, imagine this, we, we have seen, uh, uh, certainly since World War II, a constant strengthening of the executive so that uh, the rulers uh, can, can more effectively uh, uh, carry out what they want to do in society and especially in terms of war uh, uh, through this executive. A and yet, uh, because of their panic over uh, Trump, and we can talk about why they're so panicked over uh, Trump, they are now undermining uh, executive uh, authority. Right. We see a corporate media uh, that is a creation of the ruling class. This whole idea about uh, balance in journalism, what, that journalism uh, uh, weighs uh, right and wrong and finds some kind of middle. Uh, was created by uh, uh, the rich folks who owned the biggest newspapers so that they uh, could uh, set up a situation uh, in which the parameters of discussion uh, among the masses uh, were shrunken to what, uh, what, what uh, the ruling class uh, was, uh, was willing uh, to discuss. And so they made Columbia Journalism Schools and all these other J schools uh, to narrow uh, the, the uh, the, the spectrum of, of what journalism uh, is. Uh, but now, in this crisis of legitimacy, uh, we, we, see, uh, the, uh, we see the corporate media uh, totally abandon uh, all of its so-called ethics, all of its uh, 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 commitment uh, to, to balance. Uh, and nonpartisanism and all those other phony, phony values uh, that that they claimed to have. This 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 shows that they uh, uh, have reached a, a point uh, in which they decided that they cannot rule in the old ways, uh, but they don't know what the new ways are going to be, uh, and that is the real danger of fascism. <coughs> what? do they do now that they abandon these bourgeois democratic uh, premises and facades? Uh, yeah. this, is, this is very interesting. Uh, and you and I have talked about this uh, for some time. Uh, see, I don't think that the fascists have to run for office or have to uh, stage a coup d'etat to take power. The fascists are already embedded in the state. Uh, what do you call a John Negroponte? Uh, how do you politically define a Samantha Powers or a um, Gloria Newland or a Susan Rice? I mean, you know, we could we could name them. They don't have to run for office. And as you mentioned, um, and, and this is very interesting, coming to the end of a 70-some year era of the, and I put quotes again, this is John Foster Dulles, <laughs> the American century. That is the world constructed institutionally and politically and militarily by Americans and representatives of the American ruling class and political class. Uh, 
And as a part of that, a principal institution of this new American century is the American presidency. It is an institution of the, quote, American century. And, and by that, you know, that concept should be understood as a concept hatched by hegemonist. It's not a century of democracy. It is a century of the struggle to achieve complete hegemony over the people of the planet and its resources. And the American presidency, even more than the IMF or the EU or NATO, is the principal instrumentality of war. But if that is the case, then we have to understand what fascism is and is not. Our situation is not Germany of 1930, where fascism swept from outside <coughs> and took power. The fascists have gradually taken power over these past seven decades. And that is why, in many ways, the first black president is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, reactionary president presidencies in the United States history. <laughs> By every measure of war and peace, of democracy and social justice, Barack Obama is far more reactionary than Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, or even George W. Bush, or, or his father. I mean, it's, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any question about it. And this presidency, became the instrumentality of a new hegemonism, perhaps reflective of a new desperation. The TPP and the pivot to Asia perhaps tell us more about the Obama presidency than perhaps anything else, to position itself for war in Asia, Northeast Asia, but that war would not just be with China or North Korea, it would extend to Russia, which is also an Asian, a Northeast Asian power. I just wanted to say um, one other thing um, about the crisis and contradiction of the presidency of the United States, which you were mentioning, Glenn. If we don't know anything else, the institution of the presidency is in a crisis the likes of which the country maybe has never experienced. Even at the time of the Civil War, the secessionist states did not throw the presidency into crisis. We are looking at a crisis of the American presidency. Now, if, if what I am saying is correct, that the pres American presidency is the principal instrumentality of war and hegemonism, what does it, what does it mean that that institution is in crisis? Let me just make one quick point. One, one, let me, one quick point. It is a crisis of the capacity of American imperialism to carry out its objectives. That is the panic. Hold on, one last point then, one, one last point. <laughs> Trump, let's be honest. If he represents anything, and of course, this is not a even and, and a linear process. It's filled with contradiction. If he represents anything, it is the sense 
that we cannot afford to be the single hegemon in the world. Like him or dislike him, we don't want to pay for NATO. He insults Angela Merkel. <laughs> the main, what, what is Germany? What, is, what has the 20th century Germany been? It has been the strike force of world imperialism. And still, Germany is the front line of the NATO forces going towards Eastern Europe and, the, and Russia. The contradiction between Merkel and Trump is a contradiction, I think, on the basis of can the United States bankroll world he hegemonism and war? The other thing is the pullback from TPP. And whether, you know, and, and none of this is, is, you know, so you can't say, well, it's going to be this way. You, I mean, this is it's fluid. And the pullback from the policy of encircling China. Now, he talks a lot. You know, too much. <laughs> you know, but what we see objectively is... <coughs> U.S. imperialism not being able to realize the objectives, i.e., no-fly zone in Syria. So everybody that wants Clinton in there, all right, you want a war with Russia. Let's be real. Is that what you really want? Uh, Clinton, Samantha Powers, Gloria Nuland, we push further into Ukraine into the um, uh, Baltic states, bring all of them into NATO, including Georgia, encircle Russia, <clears throat> give them a fiat accompli, similar to what Hitler gave to them when he invaded the Ukraine. You want, you love Clinton? That's what you get. With Trump, let's speak strategically, the presidency the instrument of global hegemonism and the one polar world is in crisis. Aren't we supposed to be in favor of crises of our opponents? I mean, or do we not want them in crisis? I'll stop thinking. <laughs> we want them in crisis. We But of course, when the wounded animal uh, is hurting, he becomes uh, dangerous. I think I saw that in some kind of little red book. <laughs> so if we're talking about the damage that's being done to that uh, all-important instrument of the U.S. presidency, here's, here's an example. We now see uh, a scandal being invented uh, revolving around the back channel that uh, Trump was supposedly trying to create, I believe, through his son-in-law, uh, to be able to speak uh, to the Russians uh, the way he wanted to speak to, to the Russians. Uh, and this corporate media uh, is giving the impression that these back channels are somehow inherently suspicious, when in fact the opposite is true. Uh, back channels are absolutely necessary for, you cannot have diplomacy without back channels, without uh, uh, contact uh, with the other party outside of that noisy room. Uh, because especially when we're talking about uh, major parties in uh, developed uh, countries, uh, there's all kinds of noise uh, that's coming from uh, the, the, uh, the civil society in, in, in uh, the various countries. Uh, from the feuding factions uh, among the rulers in the various uh, countries, uh, from uh, the machinations of different factions within factions. Noise, noise, noise everywhere, and it's coming from both sides. Uh, and so the only way diplomacy can be conducted is you have a room where people can sit and say, all right, screw that noise. This is what we are really talking about. This is, of course, e uh, becomes even more complicated when we have the uh, Secret Services actively trying to undermine the uh, ex executive. Uh, 
uh, so that he certainly wants a conversation uh, that's away from the usual uh, channels. Uh, but, but, but this fundamental uh, power of any presidency, not just a superpower presidency, but any presidency, is now being cast as something that is subversive, uh, illegal, treasonous. treasonous. And so here we see the ruling class uh, undermining the very institution, the executive of uh, global imperialism. Uh, this shows uh, the disarray and confusion well, that they are operating. I would say, you know, it's, it's so interesting to say the ruling, it is the state undermining the presidency. But what it, I think what it indicates, and I think this is a political education moment for everybody, is that political power is not in the White House or in the presidency. It's somewhere else. <laughs> and this is the key. And uh, I, I wanted to uh, address uh, one point that you were making. I, I want, oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, no, I just want to give another uh, yeah. example because we're, we're uh, in this age of Trump and sometimes we can't think of anything else. Uh, uh, but but uh, this, this, this undermining of the presidency certainly was going on uh, during the Obama years. And we saw it, it, uh, one of its most uh, dramatic examples uh, back in uh, September of last year, mm -hmm. after Obama and Kerry uh, had uh, very reluctantly, it appeared, uh, agreed uh, with the Russians uh, to not only share intelligence, uh, but to share and uh, co collaborate uh, in targeting uh, uh, not just ISIS, but Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda has been especially protected uh, by the United States. And the U.S. military, uh, not uh, sotto voce, uh, but loudly said, no, we're not down uh, with this. Uh, and uh, a few days later, then attacked a Syrian uh, base in the eastern part of the country, a deer resort, that killed 100 Syrian soldiers, uh, and uh, acted, in fact, as, as the a close air support for ISIS, because ISIS was able then uh, to take advantage of that attack and overrun a uh, part of the city uh, and uh, some of the military facilities at uh, Deir ez uh, uh, Now, this was mutiny. Yeah. I, I mean, pure and simple. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, that kind of uh, disarray is as dramatic as you can get. Yes, but you, you know, uh, so we're back to the reset of the relationship with Russia. Don't forget, the United States and the Western countries, NATO countries, EU countries, have sanctions against Russia. What Trump was doing is setting up conditions, it seems to me, to lift those sanctions and to normalize relationships between the two most powerful nuclear powers in the world. Which specifically they are calling a crime. Absolutely. That, that is, if you have these conversations yes. with the Russians yes. and they involve lifting of sanctions, that that is a kind of payoff, that that is a deal, and that is a criminal act. That's right. And this, you know, of course, then that gets us into what are we, what are we, what is the political environment? This is a new Cold War. There's no two ways of, about it. We are in the throes of a Cold War. And, uh, you know, Stephen A. Cohen, the expert, says that this is more dangerous than the first Cold War. And I agree with him. And this is a McCarthyist period. I mean, it's not taking the form that it took in the 50s and 60s, where you go after communists. Now you're going after rogue elements or dissident elements within the ruling elite itself. Yes, and I think in terms of the decibel level uh, of the campaign carried out by the corporate media, uh, that this exceeds uh, McCarthy era levels. In fact, I, I don't think uh, that in terms of the frequency and intensity and the sheer maddening noise of this anti-Russia campaign, uh, that we can compare it to anything uh, uh, less than the 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 the, the kind of ambient effect that we would hear in, in countries that are engaged in total war. That's right. In That's World right. War II type of war, That's right. uh, where the entire society is 
believe that they are fighting for their survival. The ruling class is acting as if it is fighting for its survival. Yes. I believe that they subjectively believe, feel that way, uh, and that uh, they see the, the clock ticking on U.S. hegemony unless they somehow upset the whole game board because they're going uh, to lose. And that's the reason for 2003 Iraq, and that's the reason for 2011 Libya, Syria, and the rest. You know, this is very interesting, uh, the way you formulated they're fighting for their survival. Uh, and that, you know, I have a question mark. Are they fighting for their survival, or are they fighting for their positions of hegemony? Well, of course. That's you see what I'm saying? And they're not the same. You know, well, they're not fighting for U.S. survival. We'll continue to be here. Yeah. Uh, but, but see, my thing is this, that as an empire, as the the most lethal and largest empire in human history. Uh, and because so much of the economic and political life of the ruling class, the finance capitalists of this country, is connected to empire, I mean, it's, I mean, I, they think there is no, they can't imagine retreating from this because the life world that they are accustomed to, and I'm not just talking about yachts and, and that type of thing, I'm talking about super profits, are dependent upon 800 military bases uh, and uh, uh, nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers and surrounding the world with their military power. Uh, they don't know how to get out of this. And, and that's, and I, I think, you know, I, I agree with you, Glenn, you know, that is why they become irrational. They can't think their way out of this crisis. It was normalized <laughs> over 70 years. That's the American century. Now it is coming to an end. But the, um, the end of the American century is the end of the Euro-American century. It is the end of the white century. Mm -hmm. We are moving, therefore, from the epoch of Europe to the epoch of humanity, while the West, and in particular the United States, is embroiled in this crisis. You know, in Beijing, you had this summit called by the Chinese government on the one road, one belt policy. Uh, the world moves forward. People are imagining a different world, a world, well, they, they say a multipolar world, but it's more than a multipolar world. It's a new set of economic relationships. And I would just suggest they, you know, on at the, the initial iteration, they call it a Eurasian project of infrastructure, of railroads, of ports, of connections between people that are not dependent upon fin Western finance capital. But I, I seem to see it as an African Eurasian uh, complex, a new world. And if it is successful, the world economy will grow. It will grow. But it will grow not uh, it will, let me put it this way, because I am so uh, deeply concerned about Africa. It is conceivable in, in not that many decades going into the future that the foundation of growth of the global economy will be Africa. In the same way that in these last couple of decades where there has been growth in the world economy, it has been disproportionately dependent upon the growth of the Chinese economy, especially in this 2007-2009 Great Recession. I think Africa has the potential over several decades to grow at 10 to 12 percent rates, uh, which would then stimulate the global economy itself. But what we're looking at, uh, once and, and this, is, this is why the crisis is so positive. And it is a positive crisis. Crises are not bad. Crises are the incubators for the new. We will not solve 
these problems unless there is a crisis. Now you are right. We have to pre prevent world war in the course of this. But it is a crisis. We should embrace the crisis. We should explain the crisis. And we should explain the processes occurring on a world scale that are leading to something completely different than what we have become accustomed to. The normal for the West is now being marginalized in a new normal, a new reality, a new human <coughs> community is, is, is being born. I say all I have to say, you know, if I could just say, I don't want to talk too much. I, I don't, I do not share this abject pessimism of the, well, certainly not of the liberals, the <laughs> hell with them. <laughs> you know, but of, of, of what is called the left. I don't share it. I mean, unless you are an Americocentrist. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. And because of, you know, the idea of imperiality. The imperial, <laughs> or unless you believe that because America is in crisis, Woe to the rest of the world. Right. America is in crisis. The world is moving forward. Exactly. They see an opportunity in this crisis. I think it is possible for us to similarly see an opportunity. I talked about it with respect to the black vote and what that indicated in terms of the separation of the black community from the black misleadership class, which is another way of saying the black community directly and indirectly connected to Wall Street and the white power structure. So, I mean, I think we're in a, in a moment where many new things can come about. I think people are ready to listen to this type of optimism. Now, objectively, uh, U.S. imperialism and the, the capitalist system headquartered in the United States and, and, and London uh, is incapable of responding to those productive uh, forces centered in Asia, but potentially uh, in, in Africa, uh, uh, be, be, because the capital uh, ca cannot uh, make productive investments. Yeah. It is incapable. It is locked. And there are long conversations about why that is, but that is uh, the truth. So it has only one option. It has. And that option is the military. Uh, even without the, uh, the, the Chinese uh, project of one road, one belt, uh, it, it is inevitable with, within the next decade uh, that not just in China, but in the whole neighborhood of, of China, uh, where I believe two, uh, you were speaking of, of two of the, uh, uh, three of the five largest economies in the world uh, being. Uh, that the United States will get a smaller and smaller share of the economy, but that's not even uh, what's critical. Uh, it, 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 it will lack the, that is Western capital will lack the initiative uh, uh, to map out uh, the, the growth of the world, the way the world uh, is going. Uh, and that initiative uh, will, will be uh, elsewhere. See this. This is um, and, and this and this this requires them uh, that they use the only uh, the only tool that they have, and that is the military. Yeah. It requires uh, that they find a way uh, to, as I was talking about last night, uh, find a way uh, where they can shut China off uh, from from building these these kinds of of connections uh, and coerce and threaten uh, China somehow uh, to, to make uh, strategic compromises uh, in terms of development uh, with Western uh, capital. And they can only do that through, through military <coughs> means. But they have a problem, and I want to touch on this if, if we have time, mm -hmm. they have a problem even in the military sense uh, because they can't call upon uh, bodies of troops uh, in the region of the Middle East or that area in general because the United States is uh, absolutely uh, detested. And uh, since the Iraq war, uh, they, the 
huge American uh, land army has been neutralized because mm -hmm. Americans don't want it deployed. And so that what a contradiction. They have the most expensive land uh, force in the world, the most uh, technically uh, advanced, uh, supposedly on paper the most lethal, but they cannot use it. And that's, that's what Iraq meant. And, and after that verdict, and the verdict came as much from the American people who uh, are scared of casualties, uh, after that they had no choice then uh, but to rely upon uh, jihadists. And that's why we see this second offensive, uh, the 2011, the assault on Libya, and now in Syria, uh, it is Islamic jihadists uh, trained and directed uh, by the United States uh, who are uh, the foot soldiers of imperialism. And that, is, and that dependence by the United States on the al-Qaeda's of the world is really the most profound statement of their, of their weakness, their fragility, uh, and uh, uh, their imminent demise. Uh, you know, um, the, the question of the inevitability of war uh, and the inevitability of world uh, I have to say I don't accept the inevitability, I think, of war. I think if we just look logically, if you look at the logic of imperialism from a, um, uh, an abstract intellectual point of view, then it is inevitable. But I think for reasons that you've already given, there is the capacity to prevent war, especially nuclear war. I think what you have said, and I, I believe this, with all of the wolf tickets that Trump wants to sell vis-a-vis -vis Iran and North Korea, I don't think the United States could win either war. Uh, of course, there would be tremendous damage in Northeast Asia, but it would not just be damaging to North Korea. It would be damaging to South Korea. And really, the South Korean people don't want a war. They just elected a new president who is, they call a liberal, but really a peace advocate, a unification, more unification, more cooperation with the North. Uh, but uh, the Koreans, North or South, don't want the Japanese on the Korean Peninsula again. But the Japanese don't want their economy damaged in a war uh, with North Korea because they would inevitably be damaged. Uh, so it's a war that the United States could not win. It's a war the American people do not want. And it's a war that humanity would condemn as aggression and as the beginning of a world war would be rejected, more so than Trump's withdrawal, and more deeply than Trump's withdrawal from uh, the Paris Agreement. The world would, it would be an outcry. They can't win a war against Iran. The Straits of Hormuz, they're right on the chokehold of petroleum coming out of the Persian Gulf. All right, you start war with Iran, uh, they cut off the oil, a world depression. They cannot win these wars. They have, now, here, I'm not saying they have to. It's nothing is inevitable. <laughs> the reasonable thing would be to withdraw from aggressive empire. If Trump doesn't represent anything else, and this, this I, you know, this is, I don't know why it's so hard for people to understand this. I mean, I can understand the Hillary Clinton people, and even Bernie Sanders. I mean, because on War and Peace, uh, the guy is not our friend. I mean, he's not a peace advocate, you know? And, and that's what a contradiction, if I might per parenthetically say, that's a contradiction of Bernie Sanders. How are you going to do all of this for the people and still be on an imperialist war footing? Yep. King was right. War is the enemy of the poor. So you can't have it both ways, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and, and, it's only, and, and it's only the desperation 
of the left and left liberals and social democrats about what to do, that they continue to apologize for Bernie Sanders' failings. I'm not saying throw the guy out, but hold him accountable. I mean, please. I mean, he's not the second coming of Dr. King now. <laughs> so don't treat him that way. Treat him like what he is. But anyway, but um, I don't think war is enough. But we need a peace movement, of course. Uh -huh. See, and the anti-Trump movement is trumping the development of a peace movement. Right. Yeah. It's an opposition. I mean, let's think about these things. You know, I'm not a, I, don't, I don't let CNN and Anderson Cooper and... Uh, what's the lady on MSNBC at 9 o'clock? Rachel. I, mean, they, I don't get my politics from those people. You know, like they say, I'm a big boy now. You know, I grew up some years ago. I don't need that. We have to understand what happened on November 8th, the processes, and how the deep state had to, pun, Trump what the people said on November 8th. They didn't all say the same. Yeah, you got the alt-right. But the alt-right ain't more dangerous than the deep state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The CIA, FBI, you know, all them other names. The alt-right, who they exaggerate their influence in the white working class community. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The people said no to the neocon, neoliberal globalists. That's what they said. Don't, it's not just Trump. There's 62 million people. Can we listen to them? Do we believe that they're all deplorables? You know what I'm saying? You go from white skin privilege to the white man is the devil. I don't think either. I don't think these people, they are they knew something about their lives. They knew something about their lives, and they were not going to be used. First of all, let's not forget, the election didn't start with Hillary versus Trump. It began with how many? 14 Republicans? Yeah. And what about the Bushes? What about Marco Rubio? What about uh, the guy from Texas? I mean, who, was it? who were these people connected to? They all went down. Let's not forget. You know, my, I have a friend. He's an astrologer. So everything is... <laughs> he reads everybody's charts. And it's not uh, my friend Elias here. But he reads all the charts. And so he says, Trump is a pathological lie. I said, maybe. But I said, even a pathological lie can tell the truth. And what did he say? He said the whole system is rigged. Is that a truth? Yes. Okay, Pathological told us that truth. He said the corporate media is the enemy not of Trump, it's the enemy of the people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he said that, and I, I read this in Politico, he said that if I'm elected, in five years I will turn the Republican Party into a workers' party. <laughs> Now, <laughs> now, I mean, whether the guy could do it or not, it was obvious that he was running a campaign that appealed to the interests and the suffering of white folk. And that's all good. I don't expect a Donald Trump to do the work that I'm supposed to do. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. If he says that much that is true, and if he upsets the whole slew of intelligence and security agencies in the United States, <laughs> so much so, and this is in respectable journals now, they have called for his, that he resign, that if he doesn't resign, we uh, employ the 25th Amendment. You know, he can't, because he's crazy, he can't rule. <laughs> if that doesn't work, and this is in the Foreign Policy magazine, that we consider a military coup d'etat. Now, Foreign Policy is not a fringe, alt-right journal. 
It's mainstream neocon. They called for a coup military. And then David Brooks, respected columnist of the New York Times, after listing either he's, he resigns or impeaches or something like that, or he went on a radio show and said, well, I forgot one thing. We can still assassinate him. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean that Trump does not present a danger. But I think the forces opposing Trump present the greater danger. But more than that, I think something happened in the American electorate in 2016, and here, differently between black and white, and that color line cannot be, you know, uh, taken out of the equation. Okay, <laughs> you can't ever. But something was going on in this election. Black people stayed home, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio. <clears throat> we don't win those states if black people in, in, in Milwaukee come out and vote. If the black people in Philadelphia had voted the way they didn't, he doesn't win. White people. We, and many white people that voted for Obama. <laughs> white people, they said that, what was it? Um, uh, they said 80 some or seven, high 70 some percent of white counties that voted for Obama in 2012, voted for Trump in 2016. All right, they became racist overnight? They're all right overnight? Or did it reflect something deeper? And I think if we are the left, we have to know what that deeper meaning is. We have to connect the dots and come forward with a narrative that addresses the needs anxieties and fears of working people. I don't care whether they're in West Virginia or Sandusky, Ohio, or North Philadelphia, or you know, the Queens. I don't care. We have to be able to hear the people. This left up here, disproportionately in some university, <laughs> getting paid calling for people to go on a general strike. How are you going to tell me to go on a general yeah. strike? And I'm working three part-time jobs. Yeah. And you're going to get paid no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this type of elitism and this narrative that is really, and, uh, 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 no, I'm talking to and this narrative that is really the narrative of the uh, neoliberal managerial class you know, which, which, which manages, why should I accept this? Why, why is the left not thinking independently? Why is the left yeah. self-defined so divorced from working people? And why is the white left so contemptuous of white, poor, and working people? We ain't even going to mention black people. Right. Yeah, but I'm just saying on, on the white side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and what kind of left is it that has only one demand, and that is that Trump goes? Yeah. <laughs> by any means necessary. Now, but once you go to that by any means necessary, he has to go by any means necessary, then now you're a coup plotter. Right. Or you're in alignment with coup plotters. And by the any means necessary, since this is a professor saying this, and I, you know, you can always <coughs> go back to your university office or your archive and, and research, but what does that mean on the street right. by any means necessary? Right. Do all institutions and all legality collapse? Do we go remove Trump by martial law? What does that mean? And well, you understand, without a strategic vision, and I would say this, without an anchorage in the life world of ordinary people, the day-to-day -day lives of people, I don't care whether they're white people up in Kensington, Philadelphia, <coughs> shooting dope, 
-hmm. It's opiates now, you know. We yeah, know, right. we know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The war on opiates. <laughs> but, I mean, drug addiction, like any other addiction, is a reflection of other things. You're not, you're not shooting heroin because you're partying hardy. You're shooting heroin because you're in pain. Mm -hmm. Right on. And what is the source of the pain? That's what we, we black people know this. We've seen it. So what is the source of the pain? if not the social contradictions of the society. Exactly. And what does it mean to be white and whiteness ain't paying dividends no more? Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That wage for whiteness, I'm quoting Du Bois here. That wage is overdue, ain't getting paid. Now you have to think. Now we need a leadership. Not these young, I mean, look, hey, I have all the sympathy in the world for young people. I was once young. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to say to young people everything you're doing is right. You know, all of this black block and, and all this, you know, young white people from the suburbs, you know, trying to be something or realize an identity, somebody has to say that's not the way you go about it. This is what we must do, and it must be connected. We call it the class struggle. Some people call it the class struggle. I think it's something larger than that, because it is this whole question in the end of race, class, dynamic in the crisis of this system. And that's, that's where I see it. You know, it is true uh, that most of uh, this question. It's true that yes. Yeah, yeah. It's true that most that, that most people in Trump's base uh, see the world uh, through the prism of race, but that does not mean that they do not feel the pain uh, that Tony is talking about. So one does not uh, negate uh, the, the the other. Uh, and can I can I say can I just. <laughs> how they see the world and how, you know, that's an interesting thing. How people see the world. They see the world through race. And it's a very, uh, it's a very shaky worldview because there's so much that race and their whiteness does not reconcile or explain, especially their suffering and their poverty. And, you know, as, you know, 50% of the American working people make under $31,000 a year. This is an increasingly <coughs> impoverished nation. And it, you know, it does not, that poverty is, is, is ceasing to discriminate uh, on the basis of race. So they see the world in one way, but the life that they live is not quite the way they're seeing the world. This is where leadership comes in. Uh, and this is the call to the especially white left, but the left in general, to take up the responsibility of what Gramsci called that organic leadership, rooting oneself in the people, hearing their narrative. It's the July 26 movement. You know, uh, Fidel and them didn't know all about the Cuban people when they launched that boat from Mexico and then went up into the mountains, but they had to learn, and they committed themselves to learning. And I think that's what the left must do. The left must commit itself to learning from the people, from respecting the people, from li listening to the people. Uh, and again, I would say this, uh, academics cannot lead. <laughs> they can't. Uh, they're pampered, they're careerist, they're individualist. I could go on, but let's stop there. Because <laughs> there might be some academics in the room and, and we'd be outside fist fighting. <laughs> I'm, only <joking. laughs> I'm only joking, but there's some good academics. <laughs>
Uh, okay, folks, uh, we're just checking on the time here. Uh, we're going to go on with this conversation until 1.30, and Q&A is from 1.30 to 1.50. I think I'm on time here. Okay, is... <laughs> And I just wanted to tag what uh, Tony just said uh, by saying uh, that well, when all the jobs are shit jobs, and that's the only jobs that are being uh, created, uh, then it's very difficult uh, for folks to formulate in their minds, even if they see the world through the prism of race, uh, what the white man's job is, right. since they're all shit jobs. Yeah, that's, that's it. And, and you know, that's why they're voting against globalization. Mm -hmm. and. And they don't know what's going to come after it. Look at Brexit. I don't know what's going to come after it, but I'm tired of you people. It's a vote of no confidence that brought us, you know, and uh, this, this globalization where we don't have jobs. Now, of course, uh, journalists and academics will always, many of them, will want to interpret the behaviors of working people even though they might not know a working person. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the great things, and this is where we can take lessons from the 1930s and 1930s in the United States, when radicals and communists went among working people and uh, went into the South. And they learned. And that experience uh, resonated for decades, including in the civil rights movement. But suddenly we have this new vote left. Some would call it a fake left. <laughs> a soft left. A jive left. A left that is not connected to ordinary working people. That's not a left. But a left that pronounces everything and has an answer for everything. An uncritical left, and um, and you know you you see it. I mean, every day on Democracy Now. Uh huh. Um, Syria. Yeah, and yes, yeah, Syria, and and you know I, I'll be very frank with you. We used to use that term, social imperialism. Well, social imperialist. And please, I mean, forgive me. I, I don't mean to be. It's not ad hominem. It's not hatefulness. But I'm tired of Noam Chomsky. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. I'm black. Why is it so difficult for him to connect the struggle, the, the black oppression to the general crisis? Why is that so difficult? Because he's a white universal man. I guess you're right. <laughs> you know, um, but it, you know, look, you can dis I disagree on, on a lot of things with Cornell West. I admire Cornell West for many, many things. His outspokenness, his courage. I disagree with him. But Cornell West would never diminish or overlook the profound suffering of the African American people in any narrative about the crisis or how we move forward. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I think that we have to put Noam Chomsky aside for the moment. <laughs> You know, you were good on um, Central America. You were pretty good on the Middle East. Uh, you were bad on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, you're even worse on 9-11, you know. Uh, and such. Let's put them aside. Democracy Now, Amy, done good work, but let's we have to ratchet you down. What we need is something more holistic that represents and understands the singularity of this moment and the possibilities of this moment. You know, like I said in the interview with you, 
you know, you can't, it does not fit. Uh, we, um, we are against ISIS and the Assad government in Syria. Mm. That doesn't work. I mean, maybe in an ideal world, but we're, we're in a practical political situation. First of all, it's not for Americans to decide who leads Syria. Whenever we decide who leads a nation, we see <laughs> Libya, Iraq, you know, that's when we decide. So that's not our call. Our call should be to defend international law, the territorial integrity, and sovereignty, and right to self-determination of nations. Once you abandon that, you get the situation that you have in Cote d'Ivoire, right. where the French just go in. You have the situation that you have in the Congo. Mm -hmm. You know, last point. You know, remember we used to talk about during the time of civil rights and uh, segregation, uh, second class citizens, black folk were second class citizens. I think we still are in many respects. But what is a second class citizen? The law does not apply to you the way it applies to everybody else. Well, that's the same with inter international law. What the Americans are saying is that the law of nations International law does not apply to nations in, in the Middle East and North Africa or in Africa the way they apply to white nations. White people are protected by international law, black folk and Middle Eastern folk and people the United States does not like are not protected. That's what we have to reject and in that sense we fight against the predation of our own imperialism. Once the left believes that its mission is, uh, as they say, this is Samantha Power, humanitarian intervention. <laughs> if that is your policy, then what you are upholding is a policy of first and second class citizenship among nations on an international level. And that is the war that the United States is waging. The United States is waging a war against international law. The United States is denying uh, the inviolability of borders. The United States is denying the capacity of other nations uh, to uh, 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 come up with their own uh, leaders. Uh, you know, I was thinking on the way here uh, about how uh, nations are defined and, and how the uh, American white settler state uh, recognized uh, the Native Americans as nations only for the purpose of them signing away uh, their rights. <laughs> and if they did not sign away their rights, they were considered uh, savages who were outside the realm of law. Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. that was the MO right. for hundreds of years That's of this right. white settler state. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is exactly what US imperialism mm -hmm. is doing today. Uh, it recognizes and, and uh, uh, funds uh, 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 puppet uh, collaborationist to manipulable uh, regimes. Uh, but any government uh, that does, does not buckle under to uh, the hegemony of the United States is declared a failed state or a lawless state and it is outside of international law, which is really just saying that the United States is outside of international law. Exactly. And, and, and at this, having entered this stage, uh, what, what U.S. imperialism uh, has done is put itself in opposition not just to peasants and workers all around the world, but also uh, in opposition to every class in every other country that wants to find national expression. So the United States is now engaged in a kind of war against all, and not just, not just against uh, the long-suffering peasantry, and working classes, but against elites in Indonesia uh, who want to have some corrupt say over their 
uh, uh, way of life. Uh, and, 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 and because of this, we see the increasing isolation of the United States. Uh, we, we saw it during, uh, and certainly in the aftermath of the Iraq War, uh, where regional uh, governments would call uh, meetings for the purpose of collaboration in uh, development and purposely not invite the United States uh, beca be uh, because an invitation to the United States is an invitation to have all the rules broken uh, and, and, and therefore uh, make it impossible for your development project to, to, to occur. So, so they are far in a far more uh, uh, precarious position uh, than this corporate media uh, lets, uh, lets on. And they know it. And they have reason uh, to feel in, insecure and to be in panic uh, and to be screaming about uh, Russians and Chinese and everybody else who is uh, undermining them. I, I, I believe that, as I said uh, last night, uh, they pay millions and millions of dollars uh, to these think tank folks to make prognostications and there is no evidence out there whatsoever of anything except uh, the decline of U.S. imperialism. What kind of report can they bring back to? <laughs> Thank you. This concludes uh, our conversation between these two intellectual giants. And remember, this is a black uh, perspective. Now, we have 20 minutes, and we allotted that time because we want to hear from you, the audience. I do ask, however, please, no long speeches. Please, please, no long comments. Please, have a question. We want to hear from as many people as possible. Now, to start this off, we're going to take three questions, and then they will be answered, and we'll start again, okay? And we're trying to be as diverse as possible. So let's see some hands here. We've got uh, one. Uh, let's see, I can't see. Let's go on this side. Two. Let's go back on this side. Three. Okay? So we got one, you know, so we'll get you next. Okay. Okay, so let's start here. All right, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so I'm. Why don't you stand up and then you can project yes. a little better? So I'm uncomfortable with the notion of embracing the crisis. As, as you said, in part because at, at the core of what I heard you say, which was so resonant, is that um, the left really needs to be much more embedded in the lives of working and poor people. Um, and for working and poor people, the Trump administration is a crisis, will be a crisis. I think a lot about babies and toddlers. I do work in early education in the South Bronx. And babies and toddlers who will have less food to eat, who will be in less safe living conditions, who will have less educational opportunity, poor schools. I worry that another three and a half years of this is particularly dangerous and problematic. And so I, my question is, um, where, where is the, what is the agenda? What are elements of the agenda that you think are particularly relevant for kids and families who are going to suffer a crisis uh, as a result of the next few years? Thank you. So over here, like gentlemen over here, would you please stand so we can see who you are and you can project a little better. Take about 15 minutes to stand up. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'd like to ask uh, about the fact about Obama and how, uh, uh, Tony was talking about his effect and the different, like with the, the Bush brothers and all the presidents that went before him, even this guy now, how he sees Obama being such a threat. I mean, I, I know some of this stuff. Uh, 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 his, 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 his presidency. I mean, because you get a big argument, especially in the black community, how, how this guy is. You know. Okay, and uh, yes. Well. yes, the other side of the first question is when you gentlemen have expressed eloquently how the economy must come down 
due to world influences, China, the rest of the world, what will be the effect of that lowering of the economy, racism, and the military effect within our community when this tiger begins, is wounded and understands the trouble he's in. And Tony, I try to keep you out of trouble, but you can't get me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's hear from our two speakers, and then we'll start the uh, second round of three questions. Um, I think that's a very great point. I'd like to explain what I meant by embracing the crisis. In other words, not running from it. You know, Trump has been in a little over 100 days. You know, what we see, I'm certainly in the Bronx or Brooklyn or wherever, and I know in Philadelphia, in 100 days, he has not brought down public education. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, in a hundred days, he didn't produce hunger, and, and I'm, you know, I'm particularly sensitive to Philadelphia. I, really, I am. Um, and if you ever come, I'd like to give you a tour of North Philly. That's where I'm from. No, the crisis, his election, was the result of processes that had been going on for some time. I put the triggering moment as the 2007, 2009 great recession, which the majority of the working people have never recovered from. You know what I'm saying? The crisis, you, you could almost say, and I, I don't like to use the word inevitable, but it was a historical, it is a historical event. Capitalism <coughs> does not exist without crises of this type. Now, they had managed them since the Great Depression. We never had anything like this. But my point is that the left must come forward with a, an outlook, a vision, an imagination that not that they come up with, but in connection with people. What do the people want? Do we want Obamacare? No. Do we want Trump care? No. What do the people want? All the poor universal health care. Right. So let's say that. The people don't want cuts in Social Security, Medicaid. The people, frankly, the people don't want charter schools. I mean, the people want public education. This crisis, and the reason I say embrace it, this, this is my own thing. You know, in a crisis like this, people listen. They don't want to hear CNN and Don Lemon. <laughs> well, now, I'm not interested in pretty boys and pretty girls selling me bullshit. <laughs> and I'm certain that's what the masses are. They're ready to listen to people like us, the ordinary people. We want health care. We want public education. End to gentrification. Fill it up to 10-year tax abatement build all these up downtown, and we the people paying the taxes and the school system collapsing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's why I say break. Now, on war and peace, this is huge. Without peace, you cannot remake the American economy. We need a peace budget, not a war budget. People before profits. Peace before... All we got to do is go back to Martin Luther King. I know a lot of people don't like my, I don't know why they don't like Martin Luther King. I often say, if you don't like Martin Luther King, who do you like? <laughs> when he talked about war is the enemy of the poor, my nation is the most dangerous force in the world. How can I be for peace at home and not for peace in Vietnam? We have a tradition to build upon. And if that's not enough, I say turn to Jimmy Baldwin. You know what I'm saying? The centrality of the African American people's humanity. And we have to defend against, see, it's not just the police killing us, it's the black misleadership class voting for every congressional bill and in and, 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 and these state houses and the city council to fund the police to kill you. 
days of Jack's help. But, but I'm saying this. We are in the best position that we have been in in decades from the standpoint of alternative leadership, alternative voices. Don't have to worry about Al Sharpton that much. I mean, don't you feel free at last? <laughs> We don't have all that interference, Elijah. Now, now, okay, Maxine Waters has showed up behind. All that mess she's carrying, all that Ramelin, huh? Don't forget Lewis. Oh, Jehovah. Oh, no, don't do that. I mean, but I mean, now we talk. This got kind of a black talk though. <laughs> now the people can hear us. See, you younger than, than all us up here. <laughs> You know, we old school. We represented back in the days. We still here, like they say, clothed in our right minds. You understand? We ain't in jail, we ain't on drugs, we ain't drunk. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's our turn to speak. But to speak, that's what I'm saying, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, Glenn? Tony is making all these uh, policy uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, be I believe that uh, if folks advocated nationalization of the banks, uh, that that would be a popular uh, demand. Uh, everybody uh, hates the banks. <laughs> Trump's people hate the banks. We're supposed to hate the banks. Maxine don't hate the banks. No. Nope. She's on that banking committee. No. Nope. That's why oh, oh, I know banks. that. Uh, but that would be a popular uh, demand. In terms of, of, of uh, what Ralph was talking about, you know, the, what about the effect of uh, this, uh, excuse the word, this crumbling of the capitalist uh, uh, Oedipus, uh, uh, what happens down below. I, I never thought, uh, except maybe a few months in 1970, uh, that, that the left uh, was going uh, in the United States, was going to storm the citadels uh, of capital and take them MFs down. Uh, I always thought except for that month in 1970, that, 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 that we basically were, uh, that our job was to defend the people uh, in this process. That, that yes, uh, the demise of capitalism was inevitable, although there was uh, no timeline uh, on it, uh, uh, but, but that our primary job was to defend the people against uh, uh, not just the effects of, of the uh, collapse of the system, uh, but I suppose the main effect is what the, the uh, lords of capital do as their uh, edifice crumbles and how they lash out and, and, uh, and, and kill folks. Uh, but to make a simple answer to, to your question, uh, what, what, if, if there is no resistance, if, there, if people are not organized, uh, then the rulers uh, will wreak uh, havoc and, and pain in greater degree than they are suffering uh, during this collapse. Uh, and so the defensive uh, thing to do is organize, organize, organize. Uh, and, and in terms of embracing the crisis, uh, yes, bring on the crisis, but we must bring on the resistance and bring on the organization at the same time. Uh, if we don't keep pace with the crisis, then there will be many more casualties. Uh, well, before we go on, this gentleman uh, asked a question, and I just wondered if, uh, if any of you had a response. Or do you feel that uh, you got your answer? It was Hello? me. I just yes. want to know Obama. the fact that how they both feel about Obama, his presidency, and the things that he did. You know, that's always thrown underneath the bus. They don't talk about the bombs this guy dropped and all the things that he did. I think that helped, in my opinion, it put Trump in office, is the fact that he was so, uh, uh, the way he was, and, you know. Yeah, we, we was, we've been saying it like it's in the report that uh, Obama uh, served uh, to further uh, neutralize uh, black America as a 
potent political force as a parallel. Uh, yes, uh, but the, the story, the, it has, this whole story has not played out uh, yet. I mean, uh, uh, Maxine and John Lewis's behavior at all uh, can't be separated from uh, the experience of Obama uh, being there. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what long-term impact uh, the, uh, the, the, the U.S. empire having a black commander-in-chief has had on the black psyche. Uh, that, that's really difficult uh, uh, to measure. Uh, we, we do know uh, that with eight years of Obama in the White House, black folks had an experience in which uh, they felt a closeness and affection uh, to power that they never had uh, before. Uh, what, what is the residue of that? Uh, are, are folks uh, just looking forward to another chance at that uh, feeling? Uh, uh, how, uh, what, in, in terms of black political, uh, not just behavior, but sensibilities. Uh, what does what effect does that have on our internationalism, our empathy with other folks uh, around the world, uh, having tasted vicariously uh, imperial uh, uh, power? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, we, we we shall see. Uh, it's something that plays out in the lives of people. It comes out in people time and, and not in digital time. <laughs> but, uh, before going, I have a quick response. I met Glenn Ford in 2007. I did a series of forums in Harlem about Obama mania that was uh, during his election, and Glenn came up, and we had Mary Barack and a number of other people. We had a full house. Well, I'm bringing this up because um, at the time, I suffered greatly because of my anti-Obama position. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was someone who said in the black community there were uh, strong opinions uh, uh, expressed uh, if one did not support Obama. Well, I never supported Obama. He was the face of imperialism in 2008 and four years later. There was no way that I was going to do that as a Marxist. I didn't do it. But the point being that today there is a uh, there is less hostility uh, about that position. People uh, have pulled off the blinders. Uh, people are waking up from the coma. So I think that that is impressive. I just wanted to to quickly uh, add that. Now we're going to go back to our three. Uh, there was this lady over here who had her hand up. That's one. And over here. I think you left one out. It was the third question over here. No, we, we got no, one. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're on top of this, Betty. Thanks. <laughs> so there so was a question here. Wait, wait. We have to identify hey, the other. The, uh, the young man in the back. And uh, who else had their hand up? And this, uh, and Don. Okay, so we're going to start with first. You. A big thank you. Always the Black Agenda Report raises the level. Great. Uh, uh, comment, uh, especially because of this idiotic get Trump and everything's going to be grabbed by the Dems. We don't have enough organization. They're grabbing this movement and that movement and the other. And I want to know what you think we should do about it. Stopping that. Uh, Hillary clearly elected Trump. People despised her for all the right reasons that you've given. Bill Clinton may have been our worst president in 70 years. I mean, you all know incarceration, all of it, all that horrible stuff. This moment I was scared is the day after, I guess it was the election or the inauguration, he walked out of Army Norm with Ryan. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to be Ryan's agenda. But he's fucking it all up. I love it. I mean, they can't get their tax reform. They can't get their immigration policy. They can't get break the unions the way they'd like to. I mean, the cabinet is a mixed bag. Bannon got to choose some of the people that hurt us. Climate, civil liberties. But the, it's all Goldman Sachs on the Treasury, and it's all the same old guys. You know, so anyway, okay, the question always is, I agree with a lot of it. Um, what do you think the key tasks are? 
Right. What do we do? That's, what, that's always my question. Yes, you're right. The Dems are going to grab so much of it. How do we stop them? Okay. All right. Thank you, Jackie. The young man in the back. So, um, I guess my, my the question is a multifaceted question. Uh, you spoke about um, well, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, and you just spoke about nationalizing the banks. Uh, if we if we look at most of uh, the the situations we find across the world and how we have enforced in you know how we have uh, developed our imperialism, it's been a you know a, a, as we are learning more recently than than prior, it's a twofold system where uh, we try to issue loans to countries uh, to indebt them, and then when their leaders do not take the loans, then we send in the CIA. The CIA does things, tries to start a revolution, tries to knock them out of power, and if that doesn't work, then we go in with the military. Uh, so if this is the system that we've been doing for the last, say, 100 years since the, you know, the beginning of the Federal Reserve, actually probably earlier than that, um, how, is, how is it that nationalizing the banks is actually going to solve that problem? Because the, the, the uh, I, I, in my, in my assumption or assessment, uh, giving more power to banking to the federal government is not exactly um, going to lead to that end. So okay. do you have a... Thank you. And the third question here, Don DeBar. Yeah, um, that month in 1970... Don, actually, you want to stand? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that month in 1970 that uh, Glenn mentioned, I also thought at age 16 perhaps there would be uh, inevitable takedown of capitalism actually lasted from like March 31st until April 3rd, the day before they killed the king, um, and when Johnson resigned. But um, right now, uh, it seems that the war machine is moving through Trump if it's possible, and that any attempt to organize support for Trump on the issue of war, because he they're not attacking him for being a racist, an Islamophobe, no. a misogynist, or anything else. That's been policy since this country was founded. Exactly. It's whether or not to have war with Russia and China, mm -hmm. whether to risk war with Russia and China to have hegemony. That's the goal. But mm -hmm. we're going to get war with Russia and China if they pursue yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. What do we do? How do we get some sort of critical mass in the path of that so whether it rolls Trump over or not, it doesn't roll us over? That's my question. Right. If you know the answer, yeah. please. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, but I think I think at this critical moment, war is where we need to be focusing our energies, and not just because everybody can burn up in war, uh, but because that is the thrust of, of the rulers right now. And if we're going to meet uh, their offensive, we, we, that's, that's where we have to be uh, working. Uh, I, I suspect that everybody here uh, goes to political uh, gatherings, and tolerates uh, all of this, uh, uh, well, some do and some don't. Uh, uh, all, all this uh, war, war uh, cry against, against Russia. Uh, I believe lots of folks don't respond to it. I, I believe lots of folks, uh, because they don't want to be seen uh, in any way as, uh, as, as, as supporting Trump, uh, 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 allow this war talk uh, uh, to, to become acceptable. Uh, so that's the first thing folks can do. Don't accept it. Uh, call these people out. Say, what do you want? The destruction of the world just so you can get the satisfaction of seeing Trump uh, uh, flying away in a helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> so I think in terms of, of, of folks' behavior as political animals out there, uh, yeah, they, uh, they, they have to struggle against uh, uh, this war song. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're out of time. But I would just say quickly, I think people said what is to be done, at least from this panel, I think we have begun what is to be done. A critique and self-critique of the strategic and tactical path of a good part of the left and progressive forces. And the call for a reorientation, I agree with Glenn completely, that war and peace and nuclear war and peace are central at this time. I think the banks have to be nationalized. I think the military budget and the 800 military bases around the world have to be closed down. In other words, 
you know, taking up what Martin Luther King was on April 4th, 1968, or 67 when he gave the speech, that we have to attack war, racism, and economic exploitation. The way we put that together, we can decide, but we have to develop a narrative that comes from the people and not a narrative that comes from a few uh, academic leftists in elite universities. So thank you all very, very oh, much. Yeah, Agenda report breaking the silence. Trump is not the disease, he is a right. symptom of the disease. Thank you so much for coming.